dear fellow human, I think by now you have the feeling that something is not right about our current situation. But I also think that the many ill-founded conspiracy theories may have caused you to distance yourself from both the media scaremongering and from those who spread the conspiracy theories. Still I hope you will listen to me for a moment, because as you watch this video, hundreds of millions of people worldwide are falling into poverty because of the measures that have been in place for so long. And although the biggest economic crisis that we will ever experience may not have affected you personally yet, it's only a matter of time before the ripple effects also reach you and your loved ones. This is not alarmism, but the harsh reality we face. I also think that we can limit the damage and even benefit from it if we are properly and objectively informed about our current situation. Therefore, I would like to show you some easy verifiable facts that I think are essential. Less than a handful of mega corporations dominate every aspect of our lives. That may seem like an exaggeration, but from the breakfast that's on the table in the morning, to the mattress we sleep on at night, and everything we do, put on or consume in between, all are largely dependent on these corporations. These are investment companies of immense proportions and they manage the major money flows on earth. They are the protagonists of the play which we are currently witnessing. So as not to take up too much of your time, I've summarized the most important information as briefly as possible. How does it work? Let's take as an example a company like PepsiCo, which is the parent company of many of the most popular soft drinks and snacks in the world. There appear to be many different competing brands, but they all come from the factories of a small number of corporations that together have a monopoly on the industry. Within the packaged food industry, there are a number of other major companies such as Unilever, the Coca-Cola Company, Mondelez and Nestle. On this image, you see that virtually every well-known brand in the packaged food industry belongs to one of these corporations. You can easily get this kind of information. You can verify it on the websites of the relevant brands or on Wikipedia. Companies of this size are usually publicly traded and have a board where the largest shareholders call the shots. On websites like Yahoo Finance, we can find detailed company information, including who the largest shareholders of these companies are. Let's take PepsiCo again as an example. We see that 73.14% of the shares are held by no less than 3,379 institutional investors. These include investment companies, mutual funds, insurance companies, banks, and in some cases, governments. Let's look at who the largest institutional investors of PepsiCo are. As you can see, just 10 out of the 3,379 investors account for almost one third of all shares. The combined share capital of these top 10 has a value of approximately $60 billion. But of those 10 investors, three own more shares than the remaining seven, Let's remember their names and let's see who owns the most shares at the Coca-Cola company, Pepsi's big competitor. We see that just like with PepsiCo, the majority of the shares are held by institutional investors. Let's look at the top 10 and start with the last one of them. Four out of these six institutional investors we also saw at the last six of PepsiCo. These are Norton Trust, JP Morgan Chase, Geodi Capital Management, and Wellington Management. Now, let's look at the four largest shareholders. Three of these we also saw in the top four at PepsiCo. They are BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. And there's another one, Berkshire Hathaway. These are the four largest investment companies on the planet. PepsiCo and Coca-Cola 
are anything but competitors. But also the other big companies that own many brands, such as Unilever, Mondelez and Nestle, are owned by the same small group of institutional investors. And you don't only find these names in the packaged food industry. For example, let's look up on Wikipedia what the largest companies are within the technology industry. Facebook owns WhatsApp and Instagram. Together with Twitter, they form the most popular social media platforms in the world. Alphabet is the parent company of all Google businesses, including YouTube and Gmail, but they are also the biggest sponsors and developers of Android, one of the two operating systems on which almost all smartphones and tablets in the world run. The other operating system is Apple's iOS. Finally, if we add Microsoft to the other three, we see that four companies produce the software that almost all computers, tablets and smartphones in the world depend on. Let's see who owns the most shares of these powerful companies. If we look at Facebook, we see that more than 80% of the shares are owned by institutional investors. These are the same names we saw in the food industry. Again, the same investors at the top. Then Twitter, which with Facebook and Instagram makes up the top three. Amazingly, we see that the company is also owned by the same investors. We see them at Apple, but also with their big competitor, Microsoft. When we look at all the other companies that dominate the technology industry and build our computers, TVs, smartphones and household appliances, we see the same big investors who own a majority of the shares. We see this within all industries around the world. And just to show you that I'm not exaggerating, I'll give you another example. Let's say we want to plan a vacation. On our computer or smartphone, we look for a cheap flight to the sun through websites like Skyscanner and Expedia, both of which belong to the same group of institutional investors. We fly with one of the many airlines of which the majority of the shares are often owned by the same investors or by governments, like Air France KLM. The aircraft we fly is in most cases a Boeing or an Airbus. Again, we see the same names. We look for a hotel or an apartment through booking.com or airbnb.com. Once we arrive at our destination, we go out for dinner, then we write a review on TripAdvisor. The same investors are at the basis of every aspect of our journey. And their power goes even much further, because even the kerosene that fuels the plane comes from one of their many oil companies and refineries. Just like the steel that the plane is made of comes from one of their many mining companies. This small club of investment companies, banks and mutual funds are also the largest shareholders in the primary industries where our raw materials come from. If we look on Wikipedia for the largest mining companies in the world, we see that their shareholders are the same institutional investors we see everywhere else. The same goes for the largest agricultural companies in the world, that our entire food industry depends on. For example, they own Bayer, the parent company of Monsanto, the world's largest seed producer which produces 90% of all the cotton seed on earth as well as the majority of all other seeds. But these institutional investors are also the shareholders of the largest textile manufacturing companies in the world, and even the numerous popular clothing brands that turn the cotton into the clothes we wear are owned by the same group of investors. Whether we have the world's largest solar panel producers, or the largest oil refineries, the shares are managed by the same companies. They own the tobacco companies, who produce all the popular tobacco brands in the world. 
but they also own all the major companies in the pharmaceutical industry and the scientific institutes that produce the drugs. They own the companies that produce our metals and raw materials. In the entire automobile, aircraft and arms industry where those metals and raw materials are processed. They own the companies that build our electronics. They own the big department stores and online marketplaces. And even the payment methods that we use to pay for their products. Because I want to keep my story as short as possible, I've decided to only show the tip of the iceberg. If you decide to investigate on your own, using the sources that you've just seen, then you will discover that even many of the most well-known insurance companies, banks, construction companies, telephone companies, restaurant chains and cosmetic brands are owned by the same institutional investors we just saw. These institutional investors are, as I told you earlier, mainly investment companies, banks and insurance companies. They are in turn also owned by shareholders. Now what is the most amazing thing? All of these institutional investors own each other's shares and together they form an immense network that we can compare to a pyramid. The smaller institutional investors are owned by larger investors, who in turn belong to even larger investors. The visible top of this pyramid consists of only two companies, and we have seen their names many times by now. They are Vanguard and BlackRock. The power of these two companies is something we can barely imagine. Not only are they the largest institutional investors of every major company on earth, they also own the other institutional investors of those companies, giving them a complete monopoly. According to a report by Bloomberg, one of the most respected institutions in the world in the field of financial data and analytics, experts expect that by 2028 both companies will collectively manage about 20 trillion dollars in investments and in the process will own almost everything on earth. The same Bloomberg called BlackRock the fourth arm of government, because it is the only non-government entity that has a close relationship with the federal banks, also called the central banks. BlackRock not only lends money to the federal banks, but is also their principal advisor and the developer of the computer system that the federal banks use. Dozens of BlackRock employees had senior positions in the White House during the Bush and the Obama administrations and currently under Joe Biden. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink is a welcome guest with many heads of state and politicians and understandably so, he's the face of the company that pulls the strings. Yet Larry Fink does not pull the strings himself. In fact, BlackRock itself is owned by shareholders. And if we look at who those shareholders are, we come to a strange conclusion. We see that BlackRock's largest shareholder is Vanguard. And this is where it gets dark. Vanguard itself has a unique structure that makes it impossible to see who its shareholders or clients are. The elite who own Vanguard don't want anyone to know that they are the owners of the most powerful company on earth. But of course, this is no secret to those who are willing to look into it. Reports by Oxfam and Bloomberg show that 1% of the world's population collectively owns more money than the other 99%. Indeed, Oxfam claims that as much as 82% of all the money earned in 2017 went to this 1% of people. Naturally, those who own the most powerful company on earth would also be the richest among this 1%. And 
In other words, they are part of the 0.001%. Forbes, the most well-known business magazine in the world, claims that by March 2020 there were some 2,075 billionaires. Oxfam's report showed that two-thirds of all these billionaires obtained their fortune through inheritances and monopolies. So this means that Vanguard is in the hands of the richest families on earth. If we study their history, we discover that these families have always belonged to the top of the pyramid, some even well before the Industrial Revolution began. Because their history is so interesting and extensive, I will explain some more about them in the follow-up video that I'm currently working on. But in order not to elaborate too far, I will just point out that many of these families belong to royal bloodlines and they are the founders of our banking system, the United Nations and every industry in the world. These families never lost their power, but because of an increasing world population, they were forced to hide behind investment companies such as Vanguard, whose largest shareholders are the private funds and non-profit organizations of these families. To make the bigger picture more clear, I need to briefly explain something about these non-profit organizations. These are the links that connect the business community with politics and the media, allowing major conflicts of interest. At first glance, however, this is not too noticeable. Nonprofits, also called foundations, are organizations that rely on donations, and they do not have to publish from whom they receive those donations. They can invest this money in whatever they want, and do not have to pay tax on their profits as long as those profits are reinvested in other projects that they are involved in. Nonprofits can move hundreds of billions of dollars from invisible investors. According to a report by the Australian government, this makes nonprofit organizations ideal to finance terrorist groups and launder large sums of money. Foundations and funds of the families who are highest in the hierarchy of the 1% hide behind the scenes as much as possible. However, for cases that have a lot of publicity and attention, they use the foundations of philanthropist families that are lower in the ranking, but who are also extremely wealthy. In order to be concise, I will only highlight the three most important foundations in the world that connect all the industries in the world to each other. These are the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Open Society Foundations of the controversial multi-billionaire George Soros, and the Clinton Foundation. A very brief introduction to give you an idea of the size of these types of foundations. According to the official website of the World Economic Forum, the Gates Foundation is the largest funder of the World Health Organization, after President Donald Trump halted the funding of the WHO by the US in 2020. This makes the Gates Foundation one of the most influential organizations in the world in the area of everything that relates to our health. The Gates Foundation has a close partnership with the 16 largest pharmaceutical companies in the world including Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, BioNTech and Bayer. And we have just seen who own the most shares of these companies. Bill Gates was anything but a poor computer nerd who made it to one of the richest people in the world. But he came from a philanthropic family that just like himself worked for the absolute elite. Bill is the founder of Microsoft, which is owned by BlackRock, Vanguard and until recently Berkshire Hathaway. But at the same time, the Gates Foundation is the largest shareholder after BlackRock, Vanguard and State Street in Berkshire Hathaway, where he was even on the board for a while. We would spend hours if we considered everything the Gates Foundation, the Open Society Foundations of George Soros, 
and the Clinton Foundation are involved in. But because they connect us with the next topic and with the current events, this brief introduction was important. I think the next topic should start with a question. A random person like myself, with very little experience in video editing, using an old laptop, can in 20 minutes objectively portray that only two companies have a total monopoly over all the industries in the world. So the natural question is, why don't you hear about all of this in the media? What? It's a good question. Every day we have the choice between countless reports, documentaries and television programs, and yet not one of them talks about this. Is it something not interesting enough? Or might there perhaps be other interests at play? The answer we get again from Wikipedia. About 90% of the international media is owned by nine media conglomerates. The companies owned by these media conglomerates are too many to mention, so I'm just going to show you the most important brands that we all know. Viacom CBS is the parent company of, among others, all CBS channels, Paramount, where the most famous movies and series in the world come from, MTV, Comedy Central, Nickelodeon, the popular British Channel 5 and the popular Australian 10. Guess who the largest shareholders of Viacom CBS are? Before we look at the other major conglomerates, let's not forget to mention our extremely powerful streaming monopolists, Netflix and Amazon Prime, both of which belong to the same shareholders. Then AT&T, which is the parent company of Warner Brothers, HBO, Discovery Channel, CNN, Cartoon Network, TNT, DC, and many other well-known brands. Guess who the largest shareholders of AT&T are? The third one is the all-powerful News Corp. This company owns many of the most well-known national and regional newspapers, magazines and TV channels in the US, the UK and Australia. The shares of News Corp are owned by the American multi-billionaire Rupert Murdoch and by the institutional investors we see everywhere else. News Corp's sister company is Fox Corporation which is also one of the most powerful media conglomerates on earth. Just like News Corp, it is owned by the Murdoch family and the usual investors. Then the Walt Disney Company, a conglomerate of unimaginable dimensions, with many subsidiaries such as Pixar, Marvel, 20th Century, Lucasfilm, ABC, National Geographic and Hulu. Who are their biggest shareholders? Another powerful media conglomerate is Comcast. This is the parent company of NBC, DreamWorks, Universal, the Sky Group, Focus Futures, Xfinity and many other major media brands. As you would expect, their largest shareholders are Vanguard and BlackRock. I could go on for hours and show that in almost every country on earth the local media is in the hands of these kind of conglomerates which in turn are owned by our institutional investors or by extremely rich and powerful elite families. In the UK for example, virtually all popular newspapers and magazines are owned by the Daily Mail Group, Reach and the aforementioned News Corp. In the Netherlands, the entire media is in the hands of the Persgroep Media House and Bertelsmann. And in Germany, the entire media is either controlled by the German government, Pro Sieben Z1, Axel Springer, and again Bertelsmann, which is also a conglomerate of unprecedented dimensions. Not only is this the parent company of the largest book publisher in the world, Penguin Random House, and owner and founder of BMG Music. Bertelsmann also controls a large part of the European media through their subsidiary RTL, a company with 67 TV channels, 10 streaming platforms and 38 radio stations. Bertelsmann is owned by the ultra-rich Bertelsmann Mohn family, who openly collaborated with the Nazis. Because of this, 
Reinhard Mohn was held as a prisoner of war in the US. Besides RTL, Bertelsmann also owns a large part of the French mainstream media. And together with Mediaset, the powerful Italian conglomerate of former president Berlusconi that controls the most important part of the Italian mainstream media, they also own all popular Spanish TV channels. Now, to complete the picture, let's look at where the news comes from that all these media outlets are feeding us on a daily basis. The various news media do not produce their news themselves, but use information and images from news agencies such as Reuters, the Dutch ANP and the French AFP. These organizations are anything but independent. Reuters is owned by the powerful Canadian Thomson family. The ANP is owned by Dutch investor Case Omen. And the AFP is largely financed by the French government. The main journalists and editors who work at our media or at these news agencies are affiliated with important journalistic organizations such as the European Journalism Center. These are one of the largest funders of media related projects across Europe. They train journalists, produce study materials, give internships at for example the AMP and work closely with the world's largest corporations such as Google and Facebook. For journalistic analysis and opinion, all the major media outlets in the world use Project Syndicate, the most powerful organization within its field. It supplies the 506 most important media outlets in 156 countries. Project Syndicate, plus an organization such as the European Journalism Center, together with the news agencies, are the connecting link between all the different media outlets around the world. When newscasters read the news from their teleprompters, there is a good chance that the text comes from one of these organizations. As a result, the global media is often synchronized in its reporting. Plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news, news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same stories simply aren't true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 In September 2020, the European Journalism Center and Facebook set up a fund to support selected news organizations to do the reporting during the Corona crisis. Let's see who the organizations are that along with the news agencies produce our news. At Project Syndicate we see the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Open Society Foundation and the European Journalism Center. Then the European Journalism Center itself. Again we see the Gates Foundation and the Open Society Foundation. And they also receive large donations from Facebook, Google, the Dutch Ministry of Education, Culture and Science and from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The organizations that are at the heart of our information flow are funded by the non-profit organizations of the same elite who also controls the entire media. However, a part of our tax money goes to these organizations as well.
Okay, I realize this was a lot of information to process, and believe me, I've made it as short as possible, and I've only used those examples that seem necessary to show you the overall picture, so you can understand the current situation better. It is an all-encompassing topic that can change our view on many historical events, but my goal is to inform you about the danger in which we presently find ourselves. There will be enough time for us to delve into the past, so let's talk about the current events now. The elite that controls every aspect of our lives, up to the information that we receive, depends on an unimaginably coordinated collaboration to keep all the different industries on Earth connected to each other, in order to ensure they all work in the elite's interests. This happens at the World Economic Forum, one of the most important organizations in the world. At its annual meeting in Davos, the CEOs of the largest companies on earth gather along with heads of state, politicians and other influential individuals and organizations like UNICEF and Greenpeace. Serving on the board of trustees are former US Vice President and climate change guru Al Gore, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink, the President of the European Central Bank Christine Lagarde, the director of CERN, Fabiola Gianotti, the Queen of Jordan, the director of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Peter Maurer, and many other politicians and CEOs of the world's most influential companies. According to the WEF's official website, their annual membership fee ranges between 53,000 and 530,000 euros. But according to the WEF's year reports, Around 71% of their total budget comes from its partners, who in this way pay for the membership of young politicians who cannot afford their own fee. Wikipedia reports the following. According to critics, the WEF is a business forum where the wealthiest companies can negotiate deals with other companies or with politicians. The purpose of the WEF for many of the participants would be personal gain instead of solving global problems. I don't like to make assumptions, but would there be so many problems on earth if the key industry leaders, bankers and politicians since 1971 had gathered annually to solve our world's problems? Is it not strange that the world's leading environmental organizations have been meeting for 50 years with the CEOs of the most heavily polluting corporations while things just keep getting worse for our natural world? That these critics of the WEF are right soon becomes clear when we look at who the most important partners are that account for almost 71% of the WEF's budget. They are BlackRock, the Open Society Foundations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and many other large corporations of whom Vanguard and BlackRock own the shares directly or indirectly. The president and founder of the WEF is Klaus Schwab, a German professor and businessman. In his book, The Great Reset, he describes in detail the plans of his organization. The coronavirus, according to him, is the excellent opportunity to literally reset our society in every regard. He calls this Build Back Better, and this slogan seems to be the motto of all globalist politicians in the world. And it's now a historical moment, a crucial moment, to rebuild the future, to reset our policies. And of course, we also want to work together on building back better. You know, I said we're going to build back and we're going to build back better. It's certainly a major crisis. But it also offers us a unique opportunity. We must use this historical opportunity. Together we can turn a crisis into an opportunity. But this global pandemic has also created an opportunity to build back better. To build back better later. But also to build back better. To build back a better world. To build back better. We can't just build back, we gotta build back better. And achieve the sustainable development goals. And climate action is an essential part of that. According to Schwab, our old society should be exchanged for a new one, in which countries give up their sovereignty to an all-encompassing world government, 
in which people own nothing but work for the state, in exchange for their housing, healthcare and all their other basic needs. All of this is necessary, according to the WEF, because our modern consumer society, which the elite themselves imposed on us, can't keep going as it is. It's no longer sustainable. Schwab says in his book that we will never return to the old normal. And the WEF published a video that makes it clear that in 2030 we will own nothing but we will be happy. You've probably heard some talk about the New World Order. The media wants us to believe that this is a topic for conspiracy theorists, although it has been talked about for generations by presidents such as George Bush Sr., Nelson Mandela and Bill Clinton. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. That uh, the affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. But also by the world's most famous philanthropists such as Cecil Rhodes, David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger and even George Soros. I think you need a, a new world order that China has to be part of the process of creating it and they have to buy in, they have to own it. These important figures, who apart from Mandela, were all among the top of the elite when they were still alive, are not the only ones who dream about an all-powerful world government. In 2015, the UN presented its controversial Agenda 2030, which is almost identical to Klaus Schwab's Great Reset. In their own words, the UN, like Schwab, wants to ensure that by 2030, poverty, hunger, environmental pollution and disease no longer exist on Earth. It sounds like a sympathetic plan, until you read the fine print. You see, the idea is that Agenda 2030 is going to be paid for by us, the citizens. And just as it is currently required of us that we give up our basic rights for the sake of public health, we will be demanded to give up our wealth in favor of poverty reduction. These are not conspiracy theories. You can read this for yourself on their official website. In short, it boils down to this. The UN wants to take the tax money from all Western countries and give it to the mega corporations of the elite, who will be contracted to rebuild society. Globally, a completely new infrastructure is needed because fossil fuels must be made a thing of the past, according to the UN. For this immense project, a world government is needed, says the UN. And the same UN takes it upon herself to be this global government. Just like Schwab, the UN also believes that a pandemic is the perfect opportunity to accelerate the implementation of Agenda 2030. It is worrisome that the WEF and the UN openly admit that they consider pandemics and other disasters as an opportunity to transform society, especially since we have seen that the elite have all the resources at their disposal to make us believe that there is a pandemic, and even to create one. So we certainly should not take these things lightly, and we should examine them carefully. And when we do that, we come across things that are even more troubling. On Friday, October 18, 2019, months before the pandemic was declared, 
a meeting was held at the Pierre Hotel in New York City for a select group of about 130 very important guests, including politicians and the world's most respected medics and pharmacists. The purpose of the meeting was to simulate the possible scenarios in the event of a global pandemic. This could be a coincidence, you might say. For this simulation, however, a coronavirus was used as an example. The simulation covered in detail how the coronavirus would develop and how they could only control this through the intensive collaboration of entire industries, governments and government agencies. Once again, a new world order to save us from destruction. Does it surprise you when I tell you that this meeting called Event 201 was organized by none other than the World Economic Forum, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the John Hopkins Institute? This is not a conspiracy theory. Check the official website of Event 201 for yourself. Perhaps at this point it will no longer surprise you that the German Robert Koch Institute, which like every national health institute in the world is closely linked to the WHO, which is funded by Bill Gates, created a similar simulation in 2012. As was the case during Event 201, the simulation assumed the coronavirus. This simulation assumed that in a Southeast Asian food market a coronavirus would spread from animal to human. How coincidental, isn't it? In this simulation it takes several weeks for the authorities to identify the virus, allowing it to spread worldwide. A simulation is made of the consecutive three years, in which there are lockdowns and economies are destroyed. But also the impact on society is simulated in all aspects. Even the protests. I won't tire you with the details. In fact, you can download this analysis for yourself from the website of the German government. The last thing I want to show is an excerpt from a lecture that Belgian top virologist Mark van Ranst gave on January 22, 2019 at the Chatham House a major non-profit organization in London, where important world leaders meet to discuss global issues. Winners of the Chatham House Prize include Hillary Clinton, Melinda Gates and John Kerry. What Van Rans is discussing is simply shocking. Van Rans in fact explains how he has fooled the entire Belgian population during the swine flu through fear-mongering, out-of-context mortality rates and media manipulation. He laughingly explains how he managed to impose the vaccine for the swine flu on the frightened Belgian population, a vaccine produced by the pharmaceutical companies he worked for. Thank you very much, Up. Thanks for the invitation. And I was asked to to tell you about my experiences being the, the crisis manager, the flu commissioner for, for Belgium and, and, and highlighting the communication. Uh, and then you have one opportunity to do it right. I mean, day one is so important. Uh, in day one, you start your communication with the press, with the people, and, uh, and you have to do it right. I mean, you have to go for one voice, one message. In Belgium, they chose to uh, appoint a non-politician to do that. I mean, I have no party affiliations, and that makes things a little bit, at that time at least, a little bit easier, because you're not, you're not attacked politically, majority, minority, uh, that doesn't come into play, and that was a huge advantage. The second advantage is that you can play in Brussels the complete naive guy, and, uh, and get a lot more done than you would otherwise be, uh, be able to do. You have to be omnipresent that first day or the first days so that you attract the media attention, uh, you, you make an agreement with them that you will tell them all, and if they call, you will pick up the phone. When you do that, then you can profit from these early days to, uh, to get complete carpet coverage of the field, and they're not going to search for alternative voices there. And if you do that, that makes things uh, a lot easier. These first weeks, 
that's easy street. When you have no opposition and, and everybody needs news and they can come to you for news, you can bring quite a lot of neutral information and it is picked up and, uh, and it, is, it is, well, the news is brought the way you bring it and that is, uh, you can only do that in the, uh, the first couple of weeks or months. And then you have to say, okay, well, we will have H1N1 deaths. Of course, that would be unavoidable. Uh, I used there Sir Donaldson's uh, quote where he said that in the UK, by the peak of the epidemic, 40 people would die uh, per day uh, at the end of the summer. Uh, so 62 at that time million people in the UK, 40 deaths a day. I worked it out for Belgium. That would be seven deaths a day at the peak of the epidemic. I used that in the media. Seven Belgian flu uh, deaths per, uh, per day at the peak of the epidemic would be realistic. That is true in every year, even interpandemically. <laughs> that, that, that is very, very conservative. However, talking about fatalities is important because when you say that, people say, wow, what do you mean? People die because of influenza? And that was a necessary step to, uh, to take. And then, of course, a couple of days later, you had the first uh, H1N1 death in the country. And the scene was set and it was already talked about. And then you had to pick uh, who is going to be vaccinated first. Huh? And then, well, women and children first, whatever. I mean, risk groups, they were important. And then I misused the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the top, top football soccer clubs in Belgium um, inappropriately uh, and against all uh, agreements vaccinated their, uh, they made their soccer players priority people. So I said, I can use that. Because if the, the population really believes that this, this vaccine is so desirable that even the soccer players would be dishonest to get their vaccine, uh, I, I said, okay, I can, I can play with that. So I made a big fuss about this. This is Van Ranst is, uh, is raving mad. Uh, <laughs> but, but it worked. The Chatham House organization is also funded by all major corporations of the elite, the Gates Foundation and the Open Society Foundations. We could talk for hours about the coronavirus, which has a survival rate of 99.98%, and about the incomprehensible measures that are destroying our society. Millions of entrepreneurs have lost their income. Countless elderly people have died in loneliness, isolated from their families. But I think we have reviewed enough facts that put the global COVID measures in a broader context, seen from the perspective of the elite. This extremely wealthy elite, collectively of tens of thousands of billions, has no problem whatsoever with the fact that more than 40% of the world's population has to live on less than five and a half dollars a day. Or that millions of children are dying from the drinking water contaminated by them. Or from malnutrition. Or by their bullets and bombs. They just want to get more powerful. The elite have absolutely no intention to share their wealth with us. In fact, they are honest about their plans to take even the last bit from us. And those plans are being rolled out as I'm telling this. The underlying motives of the elite will not be explained in this episode. Because for this, we have to dive into history and discuss topics that are beyond our modern rational thinking. But for now you may understand well enough with the simple logic that a new world order or an all-encompassing world government is the only way for a small elite to retain its power over an ever-increasing world population. Companies like BlackRock and Vanguard do not benefit from national borders, import taxes and real diversity. Only through fear and media manipulation can they maintain their grip on all of us. And I deliberately haven't even mentioned the inhumane blackmailing methods by which the elite keep their own most important minions in line. Because if this topic has aroused your curiosity, you will undoubtedly find out all about this in time. The elite have no intention to cure us from the countless diseases we've contracted from the toxic food they've produced, and from the environmental pollution which they have caused. After all, if we didn't get sick, the entire pharmaceutical industry would collapse. Nothing sells like fear is the motto of top virologists like Mark van Ranst. 
You will be amazed, as I was, when you discover that we have been warned countless times about this elite. I think we're being run by maniacs. If, if anybody can put on paper what our government and the American government, etc., and the Russian, Chinese, what they are actually trying to do, I, mean, I think they're all insane. You know, but I'm liable to be put away as insane for expressing that. You know, that's what's insane about it. I mean, don't you agree? For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silent, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. Women here in shock, some have fainted. Room men, Secret Service men standing by the emergency room, tears streaming down their face. There's only one word to describe the picture here, and that's grief and much of it. It's official. As of just a few moments ago, the President of the United States is dead. When you're talking about, like, really elite levels, the name of the game is blackmail. That's what runs the whole system, basically. They want compromised people because they're easy to control. I'm not suicidal. I'm not suicidal. The deep state is those people within the U.S. government that are career employees that cannot be fired by people that we elect by the Congress or the President. Are these people in control? Can they enact laws? Fuck yes. Uh, can we fire these people? No. Can presidents fire them? No. It's designed that way so that political parties and political interests cannot affect the deep state. Do you understand the nightmare of our situation, people? It is no secret. It is as open as it can be. The deep state does control America. Wake up, people, please. God, use some common fucking sense. Thank you. Something like 1984 could. This is the direction the world is going in at the present time. In our world, there will be no emotions except fear, rage, triumph and self-abasement. The sex instinct will be eradicated. There will be no loyalty except loyalty to the party. But always, there will be the intoxication of power. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. It depends on you. With this video I hope to reach you, to reduce the ever-increasing distance between us. Only when we are divided can the elite retain its power over us. 
The greatest fear of the elite is that we will realize what is really going on on Earth. And the only way the elite thinks they can prevent this from happening is through censorship. Preventing human contact. The incessant framing of political opponents and those who think differently of brute force. The plans of the elite are clear, and so is the ruthless way in which they want to accomplish them. If we allow this to happen, a new society will be built on the ashes of what we once knew. A new society in which we will own nothing, not even a home of our own. The elite wants to make sure that between now and 2030, everything you now own will be theirs. For this, devastating economic crisis is necessary. First, the middle class is attacked, which is the backbone of society. Entrepreneurs are forced to go into tremendous debt, which will ultimately cause them to lose all their possessions. After that, things will move quickly. Banks will fall, cash money will cease to exist, and the only way not to starve to death will be the acceptance of government support, which will include several conditions, such as the vaccination passport and giving up all private possessions. Because the entrepreneurs are the first to fall, many others won't immediately feel the crisis. The people remain divided among themselves until it is too late. This is not a doomsday scenario that I've made up. This is simply the Great Reset the New World Order, which has been prepared for many generations and which has been extensively tested in every communist dictatorship in the world. But this can also go a different direction and instead of a great reset, we can cause a great awakening and create a world where no one has to go hungry and where we can live in a sustainable way, in freedom with each other and with nature. This is not a idealistic daydream. There have always been forces that have sought to break the power of the elite, but until recently, our means of communication were always insufficient to get a mass network in motion. The elite have always kept us in ignorance about the discoveries of geniuses such as Tesla, who was far advanced in the field of clean, free energy or Dr. Reif, who used radio waves to cure at least 16 terminal cancer patients before he, just as Tesla, died in a suspicious manner. Or Henry Ford, who in 1941 had already made a car out of bioplastic that proved stronger than steel. The elite have hidden countless such techniques from us because they form a threat to their monopolies in every industry. These were techniques that would have given us freedoms and put the elite's power at risk, which is based on our fear and dependence on their projects. These are not conspiracy theories, but facts. What I am saying is that a world of new possibilities is opening up for all of us, where there is no poverty, no pollution, diseases or wars, and in which governments work for the welfare of the people rather than the other way around. Countless ailments that provide the pharma industry with hundreds of billions of dollars will be cured. No one will have to work their ass off to live a dignified life. People will no longer live in fear because of the lies of the media, the pharma industry, the climate lobbies and politicians. 
It's all on the horizon, but we have to go through the storm first and recognize what the real problem is in our society. I want to thank you for listening to me, and I hope someday, in freedom, together we'll reflect back on this unique moment in history. There is still so much to tell, but we will save the rest for later. This video was only intended as an introduction. This is where our journey starts, and it will be a difficult one, but we will undertake it together, and we will help each other get up when we fall. We will not be afraid. We are the 99%.